Hey everybody, welcome back. Another video for you. Been a few days since I was able to record. Let me just begin with the humble apology. I am sorry I had COVID. Yes, I am one of the lucky ones who contracted COVID. And well, to be perfectly honest, I was inc incredibly lucky because I had almost no symptoms. So I sat in my garage, uh, quarantined from my family for basically a week and uh, very little happened, but I was not able to record. I wasn't able to gather everything together. And luckily I am now doing uh, just fine. So um, that is what explains my brief absence, but there's as always so much to cover, so much to discuss. So let's just jump right into that. Anything I can't cover today will be on the Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Eric Dreitzer. So many different subjects to cover. I can never do it all in a short video, but let's get into a couple of economic questions. And then uh, towards the end, I want to talk a little bit about a firsthand account uh, from a survivor in Mariupol, partially because it challenges some of the uh, some of the information that we have gotten uh, from the Western press. So it's important that we look at that as well. But first to the economics, we're going to talk uh, pretty extensively here about uh, Russian oil. That is really the center of a lot of discussion in Europe right now, whether or not, uh, whether and how Russian oil can be essentially embargoed, at least among the G7 and uh, the European, you know, economic powerhouses, especially, of course, Germany and France. Um, so the question about banning Russian oil, particularly uh, to the G7 countries, is, is, is really at the center of all of this. The EU is now saying that they plan to phase out Russian oil by 2027. Well, folks, we're already into 2022. So the idea of phasing out Russian oil in the next five years is certainly ambitious, but is it practical? Is it realistic? Let's talk through some of the implications. So far, at least so far, these are the, this is what the Europeans, uh, you know, and their spokespeople like von der Leyen and others, what they are targeting. But actually looking at what they've what they've put on the table it's basically just vague statements we don't actually have anything concrete as to how this would really be carried out so that is one reason for us to be somewhat skeptical of um you know this initiative now there are other reasons why you know this is a complicated fact uh, uh issue for one smaller countries outside of the g7 are extremely nervous about the impact of all of this. You can look at, uh, I think it was in the Financial Times, there was a whole piece about Hungary and about how uh, Orban in Hungary is basically uh, on the fence here that he would, in theory, support banning Russian oil, but not at the cost of tanking his own economy. So obviously there are real divisions even within Europe as to whether or not this is workable and whether or not it's a desirable course of action. So in, in talking through uh, what the implications are, we need to understand something about the scale of Russian oil uh, exports or rather the imports into other countries. So let's just talk about the countries that import roughly 100% of their oil from Russia. That would include countries that are very much within Russia's sphere of influence and under their direct control like Belarus, uh, some that are sort of kind of within their so-called sphere of influence, but also uh, have some conflicts with Russia, countries like Kazakhstan and Cuba, for that matter. Slovakia is another country that imports almost all of its oil from Russia. So these are just a few of the countries that are really dependent. And Kazakhstan is an interesting case because Kazakhstan has vast oil resources of its own. So that gets into some of the financial arrangements in the post-Soviet space and the sort of kleptocratic nature of really all of the post-Soviet republics, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Russia included. Um, so those countries are, are, are extremely dependent. But look at another country like Finland, right? Finland's been in the news. I did a whole segment about this several weeks ago. Finland's been in the news because of its uh, desire to join NATO along with Sweden, of course, right? But what they seem to forget in that discussion is that as of 2019, Finland imported 80 to 85 percent of its oil from Russia. Now, this is not to say the Finns can't find substitutions, that they can't find other sources to purchase oil from, but it's going to be costly. It's going to affect their economy. It's going to affect 
you know, most of the major industries, industrial production, transportation, a lot of these different uh, aspects of the economy. Finland uh, at the 80 to 85 percent range, Hungary, Lithuania, Azerbaijan, all three with very complex relations with Russia, 70 to 75 percent of their oil imports come from Russia, Bulgaria and Poland. uh, They've already been shut off by the Russians because of their refusal to make trades in rubles, which I'm going to get into in a few minutes. But Bulgaria, Poland and Serbia imported roughly 60 percent of their oil from Russia. How about Turkey and the Czech Republic checking in at roughly 55 to 60% of their total oil imports coming from Russia? I'm not going to go down the whole list because there's a whole bunch of other countries that fall into that 40% range and the 30% range. China imports a tremendous amount of oil from the Russians, but it really represents a fairly small percentage of of China's total oil imports just because of the scale of that economy. So when we're talking about Russian oil and gas, of course, but oil and petroleum products, when we talk about that, we have to understand that the landscape is not even. Some countries are more exposed than others. Some are going to put up more of a struggle than others when it comes to these sort of dominant narrative coming from the, uh, you know, the elites of the European Union who have a very clear political goal of isolating Russia and ultimately economically bringing Putin to his knees. Um, So, of course, this is just to kind of present some of the scale of this issue, but we need to think about some of the drawbacks here, because while the Europeans might talk about high minded morals and ethics and all of this, this is, of course, lip service to those of us who are really on the left to really understand that the nature of capitalism, the nature of imperialism, the nature of what Europe is. Okay, let's look at some of the drawbacks of this strategy. The first, the most obvious one is a shock shock to oil prices globally. This is going to be both in the short term and in the long term. Once this embargo gets put in place, we can expect to see oil prices skyrocketing. Now, the Russians are going to be hurt, of course, by the, uh, you know, by, by the inability to export all of this oil. But at the same time, at least some of that pain becomes eased by the ridiculously high price of oil. So the Russians are going to continue making money even as their total exports of oil go down as they seek to find other markets. And they will find other markets. There are other countries in the world that are desperately going to be trying, you know, beating down the door, I would imagine, to buy discounted oil from the Russians. Again, the Russians are going to take a big hit here. But the question is, how long can they continue to sustain their current posture? Uh, if you look at some of the you know, opinions of the Russian experts, they believe that Europe blinks before Russia blinks. And they might not be wrong. We shall see about that. Now, the uh, the shock to oil prices obviously benefits Russia, but there is another side to this, and that is the major shock to European industry and to the European economy broadly. Germany, which is the engine of European economic production, of manufacturing, etc., they imported 40% of their oil from Russia as of January 2022, 40%. Now, when you consider the vast scale of German industry, and you consider just how large of an amount we're talking about, you can begin to see how difficult it is to imagine uh, any kind of a short-term solution that cuts the Russians out, uh, barring, of course, an an implosion, an absolute implosion of the European uh, economy and of the German economy. And uh, I don't know that the current political leaders in in charge would survive something like that. Um, So the second piece of this, so as I mentioned, sorry, Germany imported 40% of its oil from Russia as of January 2022. France imported 9% from Russia as of uh, December of 2020, which was, I believe, the latest data that was available. Italy, 15% of crude from Russia, accounting for roughly three and three quarters billion dollars. So $3.75 billion uh, in the Italian economy. So what does this tell us? This tells us that three of the central economies in Europe, three big players as far as oil goes, all three of them are really intimately connected with the Russians for their oil. Short-term disaster for Europe, undoubtedly. Uh, a a major shock in oil prices can have knock-on effects that are difficult to uh, to foresee, at least of now. 
The long-term effect is unclear because it's not totally for certain whether or not Russia would even be brought to its knees by this kind of an oil embargo. Um, if you ask me, I think the Russians can probably withstand it. I think it will hurt them severely. Will it permanently cripple them? Probably not. And I think that's one of the uh, concerns among some of the elites in Europe. Now, thinking about the drawbacks, not for the G7 and for Europe, but globally, this is a major issue. And it's funny how little uh, uh, white European uh, ruling elites care about thinking about the, uh, you know, the global south and uh, the less developed economies. It's not clear that they do. I mean, they pay lip service to it, but I don't know that they're honestly appraising what might happen if they pursue this course of action. Let's talk about it. A, a worldwide energy shortage would immediately cause global economic problems, specifically, of course, the most obvious, the massive increase in the cost of transportation and of manufacturing. That cuts across all industries, that cuts across the, you know, sort of the everyday lived experience of, of, of people all over the world. OK, everybody got to get from one place to another. Everybody has to have some kind or every country has to have some kind of economic production. All of that is going to be slowed and hampered significantly by, uh, you know, these these, these uh, oil prices. Now, separate from that, you're going to see a very significant slowing of trade and of investment. And as trade and investment slows, countries are going to be forced to kind of come up with domestic solutions to some of these problems. And those solutions may have deleterious effects for other countries that are in other ways dependent upon this very globalized economic system. This will in particular affect the poorer countries, less developed areas of the world, especially because they simply don't have access to alternative energy sources. And when I'm saying alternative energy, I'm not, I don't just mean green energy. I mean, any kind of alternative energy. If you're one of these countries that's sitting and importing a hundred percent of your oil from Russia, or even 50% of your oil from Russia, and then 50% from somewhere else, your economy is dependent on these imports. And without those imports or with a, with a significant increase in the cost of those imports, it will undoubtedly uh, lead to political turmoil as we see in, you know, in, in places already, places like Sri Lanka, where this kind of turmoil, not specifically about oil prices, but broadly is having a major political impact. We're going to see this all over the world, especially in the global South. Um, the second aspect of this, so one is sort of the global energy shortage and the all of the ramifications of that. The second side of this is that an embargo of this kind, which is, again, pretty much an, another sort of declaration of economic war against Russia, that will inevitably lead to Russia's tit-for-tat response in the form of, well, it's not clear how they might respond. There's many different weapons that the Russians could use. They could then, in a as a sort of tit-for-tat response measure, they could then embargo the export of metals. They could embargo the export of fertilizers, of which Russia is the global leader. They could, they could uh, control and or uh, choke uh, sales of wheat and other grains that are being grown in Russia and some of that <laughs> probably stolen from the Ukrainians, as has been reported. So there's a lot of, di and that, I mean, I'm not even going to go into all of the different potential countermeasures that the Russians could Im implement. I'm not by the way, I just want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that the Russians are like, you know, uh, dominant in all of this. They're not. They're going to be crippled by a lot of these moves. So this is really a sort of a mutual destruction kind of scenario here. Uh, and that, of course, is fitting when we're talking about nuclear, the possibility of nuclear war. Um, so now the issue of sanctions is very interesting because if you were to listen to the U.S., to Biden and his cronies and to the uh, to their counterparts in Europe, you would say that, uh, well, of course, the sanctions are biting, they're crippling Russia, and uh, the sanctions are the way to go. But it's not clear, is it? Because the Russians have been sanctioned since 2014. After the invasion and annexation of Crimea, after the invasion of Donbass, they have been under those sanctions for quite a long time. Now, granted, those sanctions have been somewhat limited to a large extent targeting individuals and certain sectors of the economy uh, and not sort of broadly across the board sanctioning the country. But even so, the Russians have managed to work around them. 
Now, it, I'm not saying that it hasn't hurt. I'm not saying that it was easy, but they've done it successfully, worked around those sanctions. There's no guarantee that if the uh, Europeans move forward with their sanctions this time around, that the Russians won't be able to work around them again. And in fact, there are many ways in which that's sort of already happening. And I'm going to talk about that with regard to ruble payments in a second. Um, and the other issue that I would just also discuss that, that that deserves some attention is the blowback, this sort of psychological blowback to the West. I think the West, quote unquote, needs to be very careful and think very, very, very carefully about what psychological impact this kind of economic war is going to have for the rest of the world. And what I mean by that is this could actually have the opposite effect from what the Europeans intend by convincing, you know, other countries around the world that are kind of on the fence that won't, that have condemned Russia but won't be actively, you know, uh, opposing it. A lot of these countries might look at this and say, "Hey, wait a second. Wait a second. We might actually need to get closer to Russia to make sure that we don't end up on the uh, on the wrong end of things like this. And again, you're seeing that already kind of sort of happening with a country like India, which although they kind of have tried to play both sides here, it's been fairly clear that the Indians are willing to continue to do business with the Russians and potentially get even closer to them. So uh, does this mean that India and China are, are, you know, represent a true alternative to the West for Russia? Of course not. You'd have to be a fool to believe that. You'd have to be swallowing every Dugan talking point there is if you believe in that kind of Eurasianist fantasy. It's just not true. But it is true that countries around the world are watching what Europe and the United States do to Russia, and they may decide that it is not in their interest to align with the West as it does what it's doing to Russia. Um, I think that we should be uh, sober in our thinking about how countries say in Africa or in Latin America, how country or even in, you know, even in Southeast Asia, for that matter, how countries uh, in other parts of the world are viewing this and whether or not they're reaching the same conclusions by the European and, and American actions as we in the West would like to maybe think that they are, or at least, you know, those who are aligned with the ruling classes of the West might think that they are. So this is not to say that the G7 and the Europeans, that they can't pull this off. They absolutely can. They can embargo Russian oil if they choose to do so. There are ways to do it successfully, but it's not clear whether it will actually be productive. They can take concrete steps. They can assure some kind of stability. They can create funds for countries to draw on. They can uh, move forward with massive investments into alternative energy sources. There's a lot of different things that they can do. But if you read the Western press, you know, the corporate media, you get the impression that they are sort of omnipotent, in, in, that they have that they have all the power to basically inflict whatever damage they want onto Russia. Now, that's not really true. If you read good publications, they do talk about some of the nuances here. But broadly speaking, if you're just consuming the three minute sound bites or three minute video packages on CNN or, you know, wherever it might be, you're getting a very false impression of just how strong Europe's hand is relative to Russia's. All right, moving on. I'm already, my God, it's already 18 minutes. So moving on, I want to just talk about the ruble payment side of the oil question, because the we all know that the Russians have already made a demand uh, and put it into law that Russia, uh, that Gazprom and, and, and Russian energy exporters, that they be um, paid uh, only in rubles. And there are various schemes that are being discussed for how this could be actually uh, carried out. Um, well, let me, let me just, let me just say who's on board and who's not. Uh, first of all, Hungary and Orban, which is an interesting country because they do have a lot of alignment with Russia, but they have kind of straddled the line here. Hungary has a long historic legacy of antipathy towards Russia and the Soviet Union going back. Well, I don't have to go into the whole Soviet history. I think you all probably know the relations between the Soviet Union and the, uh, you know, those countries uh, of the the Warsaw Pact, those countries behind the Iron Curtain, as it were. Um, but anyway, Hungary has aligned with Russia on a lot of this sort of social cultural issues, LGBT attacks and things like that. But Hungary also has a long 
memory here. And so they've kind of been walking a line in the middle. Hungary has already said they are on board making payments for Russian energy in rubles. Now, Germany, Italy, and Austria, the countries, their governments are absolutely not on board. However, the major oil companies in those countries have already signaled that they are on board, or at least that they're looking into it, specifically Uniper, which is the German uh, oil company, Eni, the Italian oil company, and OMV, the Austrian oil company, all three are on board with the scheme. Now, what is the scheme? How does this actually work? Well, there's two, there's sort of, there's, the, well, the system is set up so that uh, the Russian law requires that any business, any of these uh, importers that are purchasing Russian energy, that they essentially open two bank accounts uh, in Russia. One where they can make deposits into that bank account as payments in, in dollars or, or uh, uh, euro. And then a second account where those where that money can be transferred and converted into rubles. And then from that second account, the payment actually made to Gazprom, right? So that is the sort of two-step process that the Russians are now requiring in order for countries to continue to be able to get these imports. Now, um, uh, uh, the question is whether or not this is actually breaching sanctions. If you were to just listen to what the European Union leadership has to say, it absolutely does. And the reason is because this scheme requires the uh, uh, involvement and uh, um, currency exchange by the Russian Central Bank. The Russian Central Bank is one of the primary targets of the Western sanctions, and therefore this is considered a, a violation of sanctions. However, and this is a giant however, again, as I've already mentioned, the Europeans are not you know, ignorant of what this could mean for Europe. So there is now the question of whether or not the sanctions have a major loophole. And the loophole basically, um, you know, more or less would be that the, that the Russians would have to agree that the Europeans have settled their debts the moment they make the deposit in dollars and euros. As of now, the balance, quote unquote, the balance owed to Gazprom is not cleared until the, uh, you know, Gazprom receives the rubles as payment, right? Not when they do, not when the, uh, the importing country deposits in euros and dollars, but rather when Gazprom takes the, takes the rubles, that is when the transaction is closed. So one option that's being discussed is if they could get uh, uh, Gazprom to basically agree that the transaction is actually closed when the deposit is made, not when Gazprom withdraws rubles, but rather when the companies pay in in dollars or euros. The second option that's being floated is that those buyers like any and OMV and Germany's Unipair, that these buyers publicly declare that from their end, the transaction is complete once they have actually uh, um, uh, deposited it and gotten confirmation from the Russians. But here's the sort of interesting hitch in all of this. The Russians have to agree to this. The Russians have to agree to accept the payment rather than the actual withdrawal of the funds as having completed the transaction. There's absolutely no guarantee that the Russians would. Um, I'm not, you know, I can't, I, I can't envision why they would other than because they're starved for cash. So it could be that the Russians need the cash so badly they might agree to something like that. On the other hand, they may simply say, not a chance. So I guess we'll wait and see how that all plays out. Um, all right, I'm 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 running out of time, so I want to just uh, cover one last article here. This is a very interesting one that I I want to give a thank you to Facebook friend Matt Rubenstein for posting this. I, he didn't send it to me, but he posted it, and I read it. So uh, this is an interesting piece from a German publication, Der Freitag. So that would be uh, Freit. I'll, I'll I'll include the link uh, down below. Um, now I'm obviously I'm not a German speaker, so I'm reading this in translation. The translated headline: My escape from Mariupol to Russia. Three weeks of crossfire, one week of an odyssey. This is written under a pseudonym by a person named Aisha Mustafaeva. Now, uh, Aisha Mustafaeva, or the person claiming to be that, 
under that name. Uh, this is somebody who has escaped from Mariupol, who has written about her experiences. Now, I bring this up and I, and I focus on this article not, and I repeat, not because I believe everything in it to be the gospel truth, nor because I think an individual's opinion of what they experience necessarily should inform the broader understanding of a, of a conflict raging over an entire country or really over uh, multiple countries. A single individual in a war zone has a, an extremely limited perspective on the events going on uh, within that war. However, it is critical that we look at all of these perspectives and we examine them in good faith and try to understand what you know, what the varying experiences are and what they tell us about the nature of the conflict and also what they tell us maybe about our own propaganda systems. Uh, this is really important because we too have to be self-reflective within the uh, you know analysis of this conflict. We can't simply uh, choose a side, take a position, and then ignore all information that might contradict that position. That's what Russia's propagandists do. That's what NATO's propagandists do. That's not what leftists are supposed to do. We are supposed to examine the actually existing reality and try to come to a conclusion. So anyway, uh, enough of that. Uh, the article, My Escape from Mariupol, is an interesting one. Uh, so this is somebody of Crimean Tatar origins. Now, as a reminder, the Crimean Tatars have an extremely, extremely painful history with Russia and the Soviet Union and actually the Russian Empire as well. The Tatars were the indigenous people of Crimea. They were displaced, deported, killed, attacked, uh, uh, discriminated against. We could, I mean, we don't have time to get into all of the history, but needless to say, Stalin's deportation of the Tatars and the sort of Russification of Crimea is a part of the entire historic uh, uh, picture of this conflict. So in any event, uh, here's a woman who fled to Crimea from where she lived in Mariupol. Now, it's interesting when you look at the map, right? It makes sense that I mean, Crimea is close by. It's 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 probably the you know the most logical place to go, and yet most Ukrainian refugees are not fleeing to Russia, as you could imagine. Why? Uh, I think it's fairly obvious why people would not, uh, why most people would not necessarily choose to flee to the country that is bombing them and has invaded their country, uh, but. Practical considerations often rule the day, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you know uh, this author is among many others who have traveled uh, to Crimea, as she reports in her piece. Um, so now it's interesting to note that her husband, according to her, own, uh, according to her own account, her husband did business in, in Crimea and had a business based in Crimea up until 2014. This is somebody who is a Turkish citizen living in Crimea and then living in Ukraine. Very interesting because this is not typical for Ukrainians. Most Ukrainians, uh, you know, in, in Donbass and Mariupol and elsewhere would, I mean, are certainly not the type of people who are business owners in Crimea. So again, we have something of a, um, something of an indicator of the perspective of this person, not to invalidate anything she's saying. I have no reason to do that, but merely to point out that not every person fleeing from Mariupol is going to have such a background and is going to have such a support structure and is going to have such connections to a place like Crimea. Uh, she, she writes in her article that she lived in Crimea for many years, studied in, studied in Crimea in the 1990s. Again, one can assume there is a support network there for, for this person and her family, that there are contacts, friends, uh, you know, acquaintances, colleagues, etc. So again, would make sense why this person would flee there. Now, the piece documents some of the early days of, of Russia's attack on Mariupol. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of that, but needless to say, it's, 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 it's pretty interesting to read her account because she challenges some of the um, you know, some of the prevailing narratives about Mariupol. One that she specifically challenges is the notion of indiscriminate bombing in Mariupol. Now, this is I think worthy of debate uh, because her experience I think is at odds with some of the other experiences that we have uh, uh, read about from Mariupol but needless to say it's still a valid one. She describes Ukraine a, a, a missile that was launched by the Ukrainian military having hit the building next to hers and uh, it's not clear 
where the information uh, that it was a Ukrainian missile and not a Russian missile comes from. Uh, but we are to assume it's from neighbors, word of mouth, uh, uh, actually, maybe even the regional authorities. I don't remember exactly. I'd have to go back and look. But either way, I think it's I think it's pretty uh, fair to say that there, she doesn't necessarily have a reason to lie about this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that she's correct either. So we have to kind of, you know, be somewhat skeptical and yet also uh, somewhat trusting that this is real. So again, this is the difficult place that we find ourselves in and trying to pick through all of the propaganda. Now, she describes something that is al- that is almost universal for war zones, and that is confusion. Right. Confusion between uh, what the troops were saying, what the mayor was saying, what the federal authorities were saying, what uh, press reports were saying. Confusion because the Internet was knocked out, because phone service was spotty, because they didn't have access to information. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons for why there was so much confusion, conflicting reports about whether there were or weren't humanitarian corridors, whether there were or weren't refugee convoys being attacked. And so, again, we have to, you know, try to put ourselves in the in the position of somebody uh, in the middle of a war zone, fleeing a war zone, and trying to make sense of what they're being told is going on around them. A very unenviable uh, position. Uh, so the she also describes the shelling of the Azovstal steelworks, which. I mean, there's nothing in her description that really is 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 significantly at odds with uh, the reports that we've seen. She just describes her own personal experience with it. Um, and then her experience going to Donetsk, being picked up by the troops of the so-called uh, Donetsk People's Republic. She talks about the examination of her body, the body of every refugee, the examination of the bodies for tattoos, allegedly tattoos, you know, uh, um, uh, indicating allegiance to Azov or to any number of other uh, far right groups, according to the Russians. Again, this is what she's describing. We don't know if that's really what they're doing. Are they checking for tattoos? Probably. Are they checking for diseases and COVID and other things? Probably. Are they maybe doing other things like biometric scanning and collection of data for the purposes of storage of that data and development of mass databases and using advanced software and other things? Absolutely. So again, it's like, Don't be a fool. Try to understand these things in their full complexity. Don't be somebody who just swallows the NATO line or the Kremlin line because you prefer it that way. Um, She actually, uh, she uh, expresses significant gratitude to the soldiers from the Donetsk People's Republic. Um, Understandable. These are people who helped her family uh, ultimately get to safety. So one can understand why they would, uh, why she would have positive things to say about them. Now, here's two two aspects of this that I definitely wanted to cover. I know I'm over the time, but I'm sorry. I, I just it has to be covered. She says that according to her, she had no knowledge, no specific knowledge of the theater bombing in Mariupol or the bombing of the maternity hospital. These were two mass. Uh, well, assuming you uh, assuming you believe it and you you, you don't uh, you know think these are hoaxes like Max Blumenthal and the rest of these clowns, uh, she had no knowledge, no direct knowledge of the theater being bombed or of the maternity hospital being bombed. Only what she had heard. This is important. Okay, this is important because it doesn't prove or disprove anything. All it reminds us is the limited perspective and limited understanding and limited information that any individual in a war could have. What we have to do is put together many pieces of information from many different perspectives in order to try to form an accurate picture. I don't I, I don't want to keep repeating that because it sounds like I'm talking down to people. I'm not trying to. I just I get very, very uh, exasperated looking at the kind of fucking propaganda nonsense that comes from alleged leftists and from so-called liberals on these issues. I mean, for Christ's sake, do we want World War Three? Do we want genocide? I mean, Okay, let me calm down here. Uh, So she has no knowledge of these incidents. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. Doesn't mean they did happen. She has no knowledge of them. That's it. The second thing about the abductions, this is a big one, I think, because this is a story that is ongoing. 
there have been many, many reports of people being abducted from Mariupol and being transferred into Russia. Call it kidnapping, call it temporary displacement, call it processing, whatever the hell you want to call it. There are many reports of this happening. Here's somebody writing from, uh, you know, from her own perspective, from her own experiences fleeing Mariupol. She claims there that that she never witnessed any forced abductions or even coercion. She also claims that she didn't witness any violence being carried out against, uh, uh, you know, people who were refusing to be "quote unquote" evacuated against their will. Unfortunately, there is an increasing. A body of evidence that indicates that this has been happening, including people inside of Russia who are now forming what amounts to a kind of underground railroad to get people out of Russia and back to their homes in Ukraine. The fact that this woman didn't experience this and didn't witness this, not much more we can say about that other than she herself didn't witness or experience it. Many others have. So we have to be mindful that just because she didn't experience it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. We're going to find out quite a lot about where all these where all these people went. And by the way, as a, just a side note, we have to we have to remember that what the Russians allegedly are doing, as far as these kind of forced uh, uh, displacement and kidnapping. It's not fundamentally different from what the United States and other Western countries have done to indigenous people over over centuries, what they've done uh, it to uh, refugees from Latin America who have come to the border. We all remember Trump's family separations, the children who got lost in the uh, systems in the United States, etc. So, uh, you know, Russia is not the only country that has engaged in this, but this is what's happening and it should be paid attention to. According to this woman, she never experienced it. She never saw it. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, now, she also refutes this, as I mentioned, she refutes the claim of indiscriminate shelling. Now, she says that the house next door to hers was bombed because Ukrainian soldiers had been in it. What can we say about that other than that's what she claims? No way to verify that one way or another. Uh, if we know anything about wars historically, we know that all sides commit war crimes, uh, including using civilians as human shields. This is true basically of every country that engages in war, including the United States. Whether or not these soldiers were doing that, whether they just took up a post in a building or whether that's just a fabrication, impossible to know. But this is what she says, and it's worth us uh, considering it. So why do I, why do I bring up this article? Is it because I want to make excuses for Russia? No. Do I agree with and accept everything in this article? I do not. I actually think that uh, what it illustrates for us, as I mentioned already, is the limited nature of an individual perspective on a war. And instead, it reminds us again of the importance of putting it all into context and of gathering the totality of the information and of determining something from that, not from the individual experiences of, 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 of human beings whose Again, experiences are shaped by their own circumstances, where they were on a given day, what was happening that day, etc. So we need to keep that in mind in reading an article like this, but we also need to keep that in mind when we hear about uh, reports on the other side, about the brutality and, and, and viciousness of Russian soldiers, about all of the different things that have happened. We have to keep in mind that it is the totality of the evidence that needs to be looked at. If one person said Russians committed crimes in Bucha, it doesn't mean all that much. If 100 and 200 and 900 bodies are discovered in mass graves, that means quite a lot. I think we need to be smart about discerning the information and about coming to a proper position on all of these issues. I abhor war in general. I reject this war, the criminality of the Putin regime, the criminality of, of the United States and of NATO escalating and leading the entire world to a potential cataclysm and catastrophe, right? But at the same time, we don't abandon our desire to learn, to know, to understand, and to have a correct analysis. The left may be weak in the United States and in the West, but where it is historically strong is in analysis, in providing an understanding of how the world works. That's what our job is right now. Now and not to play cheerleader for Putin, to lick Putin's boots, or to play cheerleader for Biden, or to lick Biden's boots. That's all I have for today. Talk to you all next time.